Hey, Michael, I just cleared away four greenhouses and replaced them with this shiny new red hotel. Top of the line, awesome. How many hotels does one person need? As many as it takes. All right, the Industrial Revolution. We all know what happened. Things got better for some people, but the poor got poorer. They're trapped in ghettos. In the factories, kids are getting their arms cut off. The factory owners got fat, rich and wealthy, and everyone else was starving and deformed. Well, Michael, I'll say one thing for you. You memorized that seventh grade textbook pretty darn well there. But it turns out that for 40 years, historians actually argued the question, did people's conditions improve or worsen during the Industrial Revolution? But what most people don't know is that historians, actually having had this debate among themselves for all those years, have now pretty much concluded that, yes, certainly people's wealth did increase, people's life expectancy, the amount and quality of food they consumed increased, the living space per capita increased. The only debate now is by how much did these things increase and when did they increase? All right, all right, Uncle Pennybags. Look, it's easy for you to defend capitalism now, but you also have to take into account the Industrial Revolution, how it started, and not sweep the costs under the rug when you're mentioning the benefits. It wasn't a humanitarian revolution. It was good for the machines, but it wasn't as good for those human beings who were powering those machines. Modern people look at depictions of the poor from the past and they think, something must have made them poor. Must be the system they were living under. But they don't think beyond that. They think history began 10 seconds ago. Suddenly there was an industrial revolution. We don't even ask about what came before. And then we look at it compared to our existence today and we say we're much richer today. So that must be because the government rescued us from this, not capitalism and machinery. And you can say we've had a welfare state since then. We've had the government transferring wealth from the rich to the poor. Maybe that accounts for it. But the real explosion in wealth occurred before there was a welfare state. You can measure how much more productive people are today by how long it takes them to work to earn the money they need to buy necessities. You want to buy a loaf of bread in the 1950s? You have to work six minutes. You want to buy in 2000? You have to work three and a half minutes. That's a huge improvement. Denim. In 1900, you have to work nine hours to get a pair of jeans. In 2000, you only have to work three. That's two thirds less time unless you're getting some fancy denim, but that's a whole separate story. These are tangible things and ways that people can see that things have gotten better and cheaper. This wasn't some government law that says jeans have to be two thirds off. That happened because of the market and because of investment. Here's how Friedrich Hayek, the Nobel winning economist explained it. He said, until you got the industrial revolution, everybody took for granted that of course you're gonna live a squalid existence. Of course you're going to be one bad harvest away from starvation. That's the nature of the world. There's no point protesting that or holding a hunger strike over it. It can't be changed. But when you have a system that gradually does away with the worst of the poverty, the most degrading poverty, then you suddenly become impatient with those remaining pockets of poverty. And you want to protest those. And you become impatient with the only system that's ever actually eradicated it because you didn't notice it before. Capitalism makes you notice something you used to think was just an unalterable part of the world. Nobody in the year 1200 was protesting against poverty, even though they were a million times poorer than we are now. Now, of course, I'm not saying it's great. Nobody in his right mind would want to live in these conditions compared to today. But the question is, what were these conditions like compared to what they had before? And the answer to that question comes in the form of, why did they move to the factories? if they didn't think the factories represented an improvement in their condition. But this is still capitalist propaganda you're spewing in some quest to centralize money, own all four railroads, and the electric company, and the waterworks. You should go to jail, directly to jail, do not collect $200 or whatever the 21st century equivalent would be. Actually, the ones spreading this propaganda are actually a lot of these textbooks, and we know where they're getting it from. It starts with Friedrich Engels, who was, of course, Marx's great collaborator. He wrote a book called The Condition of the Working Class in England, and that book has not held up, to put it mildly, very well in terms of what historians think about it. In just chapter seven alone, 
on the proletariat, you can find falsehoods that include errors of fact and transcription on pages 152, 155, 157, 159, 160, 163, 165, 166, 168, 170, 171, 172, 178, 179, 182, 185, 186, 188, 189, 191, 194, and 203. What about 202? 202 was solid. We are taught that the worst effects of capitalism were mitigated by the growing actions of the increasing labor movement in America and abroad at the time. That's not the case. If you look at what the unions were talking about in their contemporary works, they were very, very frustrated by their inability to implement either legally or socially any of the things they were fighting for. There would be laws passed to limit the number of hours a person can be asked to work, but those laws would never be enforced. And the unions would point to this as an example of how the corporations are running the government. Time after time, when they fought for increased improvements, it was either a function of market forces or they got things passed, but those things never got implemented. Not to mention they didn't have any of the federal protections they later got. They couldn't keep non-union members out. They couldn't intimidate people. They couldn't force people to pay union dues who didn't want to pay them. So the unions were a non-factor. And yet the standard of living of workers throughout the Industrial Revolution continued to rise. And into the 20th century, Going into the 1920s, when around the world people were talking about the eight-hour day, American workers got the eight-hour day before their much more heavily unionized counterparts in Europe got it, and they earned higher wages than their much more heavily unionized counterparts in Europe did. Even at its height, unionism in the United States peaked at about one-third of American workers being in labor unions, just a third. We have to remember that, of course, there's no non-arbitrary stopping point for improving working conditions. Everybody would love to have four-hour massages during the day. Everybody would love to have a view of Niagara Falls. But you have to ask yourself, can the economy support this? Do we have enough wealth to support this? There's no non-arbitrary answer to that question. Well, as a matter of fact, here's a kind of case study showing that this is the process by which improvements happen. A professor named Ben Powell actually bothered to go to Guatemala and interview people who were working in terrible conditions. And he asked them, if you had a choice where you could get more vacation time or somewhat better working conditions, but it came at the expense of a slight decrease in your pay, would you take it? And 90 plus percent, no matter what the thing he was offering them was, 90 plus percent of the people said, I just want the money. I don't want you to tell me that I should have this or that. I would rather just have the money. But we're still missing the broader point of the Industrial Revolution, which is the kids working in the factories. You have to take that bathwater, but you're also taking that baby who's working at age two. What about the children, Tom? Won't you please think of the children? Nobody wants children working. Nobody in his right mind wants that. Well, what about Ayn Rand? Michael, let's talk about those kids you're concerned about. There's a massive population explosion going on in Britain at the time, and yet even with all that, people are still earning more. Those kids are doing better. The standard of living is improving. At the same time, kids in India and China are starving because there were population increases in those places too, but those places did not undergo an industrial revolution. <laughs> Sure, the Industrial Revolution made the average person better off, but it made the wealthy better off on orders of magnitude that we'd never seen before, even including literal royalty. You had people amassing fortunes bigger than those of small countries, and they were effectively above the law. And that's why they're called the robber barons. It's true that some of these people should be criticized because they wanted to use political influence to benefit themselves at the expense of other people. But we have to be fairer as historians than just lumping a whole bunch of people together, calling them a nasty name, and moving on. Because, in fact, the bulk of these people dramatically improved people's living conditions, including the workers who worked for them, and this is why they became so wealthy. So, for example, John D. Rockefeller in oil refinery took a product 
that is now the lifeblood of modern economies and made it vastly less expensive. He was able to take the price of kerosene and lower it from a dollar to 10 cents a gallon, a 90% decrease. And at the same time, he took the byproducts of the refinery process and made 300 products out of those. We read in our textbook about how terrible these people were and they monopolized different industries. And the implication is they could just set prices at whatever level they wanted to. Well, when one economic historian, Thomas DiLorenzo, actually bothered to look at the data, what he found was of the 17 industries most commonly accused of being monopolized and for which we have data, 15 of them saw prices fall dramatically, falling faster than any other prices in the economy. When people think of monopoly, think of Boardwalk and Park Place, but there's some better examples. Heinz Ketchup, Scotch Tape, Coke, Subway Sandwiches. Those are basically monopolies where you have one company whose name is synonymous with the product that everyone likes and everyone buys. But it's important for those companies to have those products cheap and available, even though there are cheaper and more available alternatives because everyone prefers to buy them. No, Pepsi is not okay. Now, it's true. There were some people in American history who were lobbying government to get special privileges they were going to use to get advantages for themselves at the expense of the rest of us. And those people should be condemned. So, for example, Edward Collins got a government subsidy for his steamship business, and he was supposed to provide mail delivery across the Atlantic. He was getting $858,000 a year. Cornelius Vanderbilt comes along in the mid-1850s. He gets no subsidy at all. And he's outperforming Collins both in passenger travel and in mail delivery. So we should admire Cornelius Vanderbilt and criticize Edward Collins. But in the seventh grade textbook, they're more or less treated the same. You know, I mentioned Cornelius Vanderbilt, and he was really a heroic figure in some ways, because he was dealing with the fact that the governor of New York in 1798 had granted a monopoly on steamboat traffic for 30 years to Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton. Vanderbilt was hired to run a steamboat between New Jersey and Manhattan defying that monopoly, and he managed to evade capture while at the same time charging only one quarter the fare that the monopolists were charging. Well, finally, the New York steamboat monopoly was overturned, and under Vanderbilt's pressure, the fare from a trip from New York City to Albany dropped from $7 to 3 The trip from New York to Philadelphia, which had been $3, fell to $1. If you were going from New Brunswick to Manhattan, you paid only six cents, and you ate for free. And when he moved his steamboat operation to the Hudson River, he charged a fare of 10 cents instead of $3. And later, he didn't even charge the 10 cents. He figured people would probably buy food and drink aboard, and he'd make his money that way. This is such a cost savings that it means people who could simply not travel before now have basic travel within their grasp. Yeah, if that guy has more money than I do, he deserves it. Good for him. And for me to pause and resent this for even a moment, is ridiculous. I think people have this idea that all these so-called robber barons were like my buddy Uncle Pennybags over here, but they actually had this very Protestant worldview where you acquire money not to have some kind of big Donald Trump golden house. The money is meant to be returned to the community to uplift the general population. Carnegie's a great example of this. He's the one who wanted to make literacy within the reach of the common man. This was a big problem for many of these people, which prevent them from getting better jobs. So he endowed libraries all over the place. Most of them took that money and said, hey, I'm going to put it to good use. My legacy isn't going to be kids losing their arms in factories. It's going to be kids not having to work because they have an education and they've bettered themselves. So why does all this matter? Because if you understand the Industrial Revolution correctly, you know what the source of prosperity is. But if you get it wrong, we're going to make a lot of mistakes in the present. If you get history wrong, you're going to do things wrong in the present, and you're going to do things that undermine rather than enhance the creation of wealth. And in particular, a number of these so-called robber barons who were actually outstanding entrepreneurs wound up creating foundations that today have fallen into the hands of people who pretty much despise everything they stood for and keep advocating policies that will undermine wealth creation and the improvement of our standard of living. <laughs> Hey, Tom, great news. I won $10. Second prize in a beauty contest. You're the only one who entered. <laughs>